New merchandise available on JG9Shop.com. Use the promo code SPIKE to get 5% off all San Francisco 39.6 or merch through the end of the weekend. Also, join me tomorrow night live on Twitch right after Sunday Night Football as we'll talk about everything that happened in Week 1. And now, on with our feature presentation. There have been so many fantastic Hall of Fame quarterbacks to pass through Green Bay that unless you're an unbelievable talent, it's easy for your name to be a forgotten part of the team's storied history. The Packers already have three quarterbacks in the Hall, and it will most certainly be four once Aaron Rodgers becomes eligible. So it's easy for fans to forget about some quarterbacks who were still really good players, even if they didn't produce Hall of Fame careers. And one of those players is this man right here. This is Lynn Dickey. In his nine seasons with the Packers, Dickey was actually one of the better quarterbacks in all of football. And while I'm not sure he was ever a tier one guy with the likes of Dan Fouts, Terry Bradshaw, and Ken Anderson, you could make a legitimate argument that he was in that second tier. Dickey was a very good player who, by all accounts, had a very good career. But when his career ended, oh man was it bizarre. His final season with the Packers was full of drama, full of chaos, and included a bizarre request with head coach Forrest Gregg that left Gregg absolutely dumbfounded. And this is the story behind the absolutely bizarre end to the great career of Lynn Dickey. Before I talk about how Dickey's career came to an end, we need some context to understand just who Lynn Dickey is, how his career was going, and what was happening before everything came crashing down. In 1971, the Houston Oilers drafted Dickey in the third round of the NFL Draft. Now this was a really strange move, since in the first round, the Oilers drafted Dan Pastorini to be their franchise quarterback, and the Oilers didn't have a second round pick, so to use each of your first two picks on a quarterback is a really unconventional strategy. Sometimes, unconventional strategies work. This was not one of those times. Dickey lasted with the Oilers until 1975, barely getting any playing time because of Pastorini. In 1976, Dickey, who had wanted out of Houston for quite some time due to being buried on the depth chart, got his wish when he was traded to the Green Bay Packers in exchange for cornerback Ken Ellis and quarterback John Hadle. If you want to see a previous video I made on Hadle, back when he was known for his time with the Chargers and wasn't known as the biggest trade blunder in Packers franchise history, then click the card in the upper right corner. Head coach Bart Starr had a lot of faith in Dickey to be the team's quarterback of the future, and to be the guy the Packers have been looking for at the position since, well, Bart Starr himself was back there. And at first, it was looking like this faith would be somewhat misguided, as in his first five seasons with the Packers, Dickey struggled. In 1977, he finished with the second worst passer rating amongst all qualified quarterbacks in football. He missed the entire 1978 season with a leg injury. He had a losing record as a starter every season, and routinely threw more interceptions than touchdowns. However, right around 1981, everything would begin to change, and Dickey would become a solid quarterback. In 1982, he led Green Bay to the postseason for the first time in a decade, and commanded an offense that ranked fifth in the league in points scored. In 1983, he threw an incredible 4,458 passing yards and 32 touchdowns on 9.2 yards per attempt, with each of these totals leading the league. For some perspective, at the time, he had the third most passing yards of any quarterback in NFL history in a single season, with Dan Fouts in 1980 and 1981 being the only two seasons better, and his 32 touchdown passes were tied for fourth in NFL history at the time. And after a 1984 season where he threw 25 touchdown passes, ranking fifth in the league, and cut back on his interceptions from the previous year by 34%, it seemed like Dickey was showing no signs of slowing down heading into the 1985 season. However, that's where things would get a bit bizarre. Entering the 1985 season, Lynn Dickey was 36 years old, and seemed to be playing the best football of his career. And especially after an incredibly strong end to the 1984 season, where he threw 15 touchdowns in his final 7 games and went 6-1 of that stretch, the expectation was that Dickey would be able to do more of the same. But as we would quickly find out, that was not the case. In Week 1, the Packers lost to the Patriots 26-20, and Dickey completed less than 50% of his passes while taking 7 sacks. He was taking a beating back there. Even though the Packers beat the Giants the following week, Dickey didn't play great, taking 4 sacks and throwing for 188 yards, 1 touchdown, and an interception. But it was Week 3 where things really went south. It's September 22nd and the Packers are taking on the New York Jets at Milwaukee County Stadium. And in this battle between two teams with identical 1-on-1 -on -one records looking to get above 500, the Jets won easily, taking a 24-3 and scoring 17 straight to end the game. However, this game was really about Lynn Dickey and one of the worst games of his entire career. He went 6-for-18, completing a mere 33% of his passes. 2 out of 3 and bad when talking about meatloaf, but when talking about your odds of throwing an incomplete pass on any given play, yeah that's not good. He threw for just 84 yards. His passer rating was 26.2 which was worse than if did nothing but spike the ball to the ground on every single play. In fact, it was the only time in his Packer career that he started a game at home, had a passer rating below 27, and failed to put up double-digit points. It was that bad. And during the game, 
Dickey got benched for Randy Wright, the team's sixth round pick from the 1984 NFL Draft one year prior. Even despite the benching, and even despite the poor performance, there was never any doubt about Dickey's status going forward. Head coach Forrest Gregg put Wright in there just to try anything to spark the offense and to prevent his solid veteran star from getting banged up and taking any more shots, since he had already taken three sacks. The Packers were not making a quarterback change. This is just the kind of thing that happens. The only way absent injury or something scandalous that the Packers weren't starting Dickey next week was if Dickey marched into Gregg's office and demanded that he didn't start the game. Well, that's kind of what happened next. At the start of 1985, something strange began to happen to Dickey. Now a 36-year-old veteran, his heart wasn't entirely in the game the way that it used to be. Part of that was the fact that he was all banged up. A good chunk of his career had been defined by injuries. While with the Oilers, he missed all of 1972 with a hip injury. In 1976, he separated his shoulder. In 1977, he broke his leg, which was so severe that he needed four surgeries and missed all of 1978. In 1981, he had a back injury. And in 1983, he was suffering from headaches and another back injury. As Dickey would later say, the people who make comments don't hear about you lying over a training table right before you're ready to play a game and taking five shots of Novocaine in your back because you got three broken bones. Dickey was hurting, and even had a sprained throwing hand prior to the game against the Giants in Week 2, and his heart wasn't in it mentally. Dickey said that he wasn't playing well, and that the routine of playing football got old. When the preseason was going on and he wasn't playing in it, since the starters don't play a whole lot, he found that he wasn't missing it anymore. His motivation was gone. And after the game against the Jets, Dickey did something that you rarely, if ever, see anyone do. Most guys want to play if they're physically able to go. Dickey, on the other hand, did not. And he asked Forrest Gregg to bench him. Dickey said in the immediate aftermath, Deep down, I didn't feel I deserved to start. I made mental mistakes that I just shouldn't make. And for what happened Sunday against the Jets, I just think this is the right thing. But Gregg took the news furiously. Greg played under Vince Lombardi, and just the thought of a player openly requesting that his head coach bench him was enough to rile him up. Greg said, if a guy comes in and requests not to start, you won't use him. He then added that the situation is topsy-turvy, that he never had a player in his over decade-long coaching career request not to start before, and said, if the guy doesn't want to start, well, then what good is he to you? A few months after the fact, Greg would say that when Dickey first talked to him, he didn't understand what he was saying. But with the Packers nowhere close to a Super Bowl, with Dickey taking a beating behind a porous makeshift offensive line that had allowed 14 sacks in the first three weeks, with Dickey playing some of his worst football in ages, and with Dickey's heart not being in it, he knew that this was what he had to do, even if it didn't make any sense to Greg at the time. But this was not the end of his time with Green Bay. Far from it, in fact. This story was already pretty crazy, because how many times do you see a quarterback openly yank himself from the starting spot? But if you thought that this meant that Dickey wasn't going to play in the next game, like any logical person, well, you would be wrong. When the Packers took on the Cardinals, they initially started the game with Randy Wright under center, since Dickey forced the team's hand. However, this game was a disaster for the Packers, as they trailed 19 0 at the half and trailed 26 0 at one point in the third quarter. Wright was trying to get the offense moving, but had no luck whatsoever doing so, as he went 8 for 17 with 77 yards passing, no touchdowns, two interceptions, and a passer rating of 20.6. With Wright playing poorly, for the second time in two weeks, Greg yanked his starter and put in the backup. This time, it was Lynn Dickey who was in the game, just a few days after requesting that he not play. And what's crazy is that you'd expect a quarterback to completely flop in this situation, but not Dickey. Off the bench, he completed 67% of his passes, throwing for 175 yards, three touchdowns and no interceptions, and posting a passer rating of 131.9, over 100 points higher than his rating the previous week. The Packers didn't win the game as they lost 43-28, but Dickey made the score way more respectable. And after the game, Greg made Dickey the starter again, as he said, I'm ready to play. I'll get myself ready to play. That's what I'll do the rest of the year. I'll give it the best shot I can. So let's just recap where we are in our story to understand all the madness. Dickey was the starting quarterback going into Week 3. After getting benched in Week 3, he realized deep down in his heart what he'd been thinking all along, and realized that he wasn't motivated and wasn't loving the game anymore. He requests to get pulled, only for his head coach to completely blow up on him to the point where Dickey would later say, he was boiling inside. He felt that I was running out on him. Then one half later, Dickey goes back into the game, re-wins the starting job, and finds his motivation and desire to play again. Got all of that? Talk about the weirdest week-long quarterback controversy ever. Now let's see how this entire saga comes to an end. 
Over the rest of the 1985 season, Dickey had his ups and downs. On the good side, he had a Week 5 game against the Detroit Lions where the offense put up 43 points, and where he threw two touchdown passes and no interceptions while posting an incredible passer rating of 126.1. On the bad side, he had a game against the Indianapolis Colts where in a 37-10 loss, he got benched after completing 42% of his passes and throwing four interceptions. It was a mixed bag of a season, and was a far cry from what he did in 1984, and especially in 1983 when he led the NFL in just about every major statistical passing category. After a 21-0 victory in Week 13 against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, once again, Dickey had to deal with injuries. He missed the final three games of the season with back spasms, and the Packers would once again miss the postseason. Dickey said at the start of 1985 that he was looking to play two more seasons in the NFL, but then said after the Jets game that he was leaning toward 1985 being his last year. Turns out, Dickey would come back in 1986 for training camp, but after getting cut, he retired from the game. When Dickey retired, he was just outside the top 30 in NFL history in career passing yards and career passing touchdowns, and held a ton of single season records in the storied history of the Packers franchise. While not a Hall of Fame career by any means, it was still a great one, and to play a decade and a half in the NFL at a high level is a heck of an accomplishment. But the way it ended was incredibly bizarre, and I think that's putting it mildly. This might not seem as weird today simply because of teams and coaches being more cognizant of mental health, but back in 1985, something like this was almost unprecedented, and was a strange end to a solid career. It's not often you see a player beg the coach not to play him, but that's exactly what happened here. The last impression that Packers fans have toward their really good quarterbacks is weird. For Starr, his last impression was that he was not a good head coach. For Favre, his last impression was that interception in the NFC Championship and the entire saga that followed in the 2008 offseason. And for Dickey, his last impression was the absolute mess that was the 1985 season. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jargator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.